Hello, my dear friends, this is Mr. Top F and in this video, we will talk about the five most frightening abandoned places on planet Earth and their history. The release will be divided into two parts, so subscribe to my channel right now and turn on notifications so as not to miss the continuation. If your intuition tells you that it will be interesting, like this video, in the meantime we begin. Kashima Island, Japan the history of the island, which has come down to us, began in 1810, when Japanese fishermen sailing not far from it decided to take a walk along the shore of a stump of an overgrown rock in the middle of the sea, which had previously been touched only by the waves of the East China Sea and the birds that nested on it. To their surprise, they found coal on the surface of the island. As respectable business executives, they, of course, took some coal with them when they returned home. But as usual in a close community where everyone in the village knows everyone, the news of the island, on the surface of which precious coal lies, quickly spread. Well, how fast? It took half a century for quite influential people to find out about this island, and before that, fishermen sailed to the island for coal, for which they were popularly called digging in the sea. In 1869, some clan, after noticing that the coal never ended going deep, took matters into their furry hands. However, for coal mining companies failed, the losses were great, and the gold did not justify the means, because, among all the attempts, only the first one was able to hold out for about a year under the waves that were carried by the typhoon familiar to these waters. The Japanese then still adhered to wooden buildings, which proved to be good in the case of earthquakes, but this did not fit in cases where you are on a piece of land 220 by 120 meters and waves that can reach 10 meters are approaching from different sides. Doesn't sound very safe, right? Only in these conditions, it was necessary not only to live, but also to dig mines, which were quietly flooded, taking the lives of workers. Attempts to extract coal here were abandoned for almost 10 years until the Fukuhori clan sailed to the island in the early 1880s to see what a miracle the coal is buried here, which vehemently protects the raging sea. Through the efforts of the clan here, by the year 86, the excavation of the first shaft of the future mine will be completed. Its depth is 36 meters. Of course, this will not escape the sight and hearing of the stronger clans, or rather, the Mitsubishi Company, which was founded in 1870 by a certain Iwasaki Yataro. Mitsubishi buys the island in the 90th year, taking control of coal mining on it, and the company had enough money to deploy much larger coal excavations. A truly grandiose development of the island begins here, so grandiose that by 1891 a regular supply of drinking water will be established on the island, and in 1893 an elementary school will open for the children of miners who move here with their families. Two more years will pass and the island will be drilled 200 meters deep, extracting coal, and by 1898 they will cut the third and last trunk, which, in the future will reach a depth of 600 meters. Needless to say, Mitsubishi received a good income from the development of coal on Kashima, which contributed both to an increase in the size of the island. Unnecessary rock dug out from the bowels of the island was brought ashore and leveled, obtaining new territories for building up the island and to the development of the island itself. Starting from 1900, along its perimeter, steel reinforced concrete walls grow, designed to protect against the crashing waves of the sea. The territory of the island continued to expand, and the island itself was built up with houses for miners and their families. Coal did not seem to end, and the mines deepened, in connection with which the company needed more and more people to work in the mines. It was necessary to hire recruiters, or simply barkers, who invited honest people to the island to work in the mine. Of course, the conditions described by the barkers could hardly be called real, which is partly why the newcomers here, after what they saw, quickly came to gambling establishments and the dens that Mitsubishi had so lavishly built for their arrival, populating them with prostitutes and filling the warehouses with good quality sake. Well, isn't it heaven on earth? So the company thinks so, therefore, by 1916, 
the construction of the first multi-story reinforced concrete building of seven floors will be completed now this is housing for the families of miners of a new type for japan earlier in japan there were buildings made of wood here apparently the experience of foreign colleagues who recently sailed to japan for permanent residence after the ANSI treaties of 1858 the european quarters began to appear in the land of the rising sun wooden buildings began to be slowly demolished relocating everyone into reinforced concrete new buildings among which was the second visiting card of the island a complex of buildings 16 to 19 with nine floors built by 1918 which resembles the letter e with another horizontal division where the vertical is a corridor on all nine floors connecting the houses themselves and protecting these same houses from inclement weather from the sea in 1921 one of the journalists who will come to see to the Miracle Island City, which occupies a leading position in terms of coal production and quality, swimming up to it will note the similarity of the island with the new military battleship Mitsubishi. So the nickname Gunkinjima, the island warship, will take root among the people. I honestly did not understand, throughout Japan, Hasama occupied a leading position in coal mining or only among the other islands on which coal was mined. One of these was just Hasama's closest neighbors, Takashima. Meanwhile, life on the island is in full swing. Shops, a public shower, a cinema, and a first aid post are opening, and now the company is preparing social packages for workers, which they will receive by 1927. Dig further coal, and if anything, then now you are entitled to health insurance, education, if you want, and other benefits are not far away. As you probably know, in 1937, Japan, inspired by successes in the first Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wars, will once again invade China, starting the Second Sino-Japanese War. From here the cruelest period of the island's life begins. You can see part of this period in a very solid South Korean movie, The Battleship Island. Very soon, the miners of Hasama in the most difficult positions begin to be replaced by Chinese and Korean prisoners of war, and the island itself is heavily militarized. Of course, these good eastern neighbors are considered expendable by the Japanese, as we can understand from the increasing mortality on the island in the 40s when several thousand people could die in a year. In 1945, an American submarine sailing past will shoot down the coal carrier Seresu Maru anchored off the island. And a bomber flying past will throw off a couple of bombs, hitting the second shaft of mines at the power plant, because of which it will remain forever buried and flooded along with the miners who did not have time to get out. This will end the history of Hasama as an island where prisoners are sent and never return. The island is recovering quite quickly after the war and already. In 1946, the Tsushima Coal Mining Trade Union will be founded, which, after prolonged conflicts with the Mitsubishi Company, will be able to achieve improved working conditions and wages for miners, which will cause a new wave of migration to the island, already voluntary. Houses continue to be built, and the island itself fills with miners' wives and children. Living conditions on the island are gaining momentum, with fewer miners concerning the population and more and more additional personnel supporting the life of the island. Children study at school, and after classes they go to the roofs of houses, along which gardens with ripening cucumbers and tomatoes spread, and there, look, a holiday is coming soon or a sporting event. Already by 1960, the population of the island will reach its peak 5,267 inhabitants of the city island of Hashima, who like to live here, they have almost everything, and what is not on the island will be brought by merchants from Japan as an order. But ironically, during this period, humanity is actively switching from coal to oil, and the coal itself on the island would seem to begin to dry up, which is why the development of the island will stop by 1970 when the last building on the island will be completed, by which time the population will have time decrease to 3,000, lazily leaving the island day after day of the former inhabitants of it. In 1974, the last people whose task was to blow up the mines will leave Hasama, thereby filling up the still not exhausted coal reserves. Many more times in the Japanese media and the media of their neighbors, the question of the humanity of what happened on the island in the 40s will be raised, but all of them will somehow subside over time, and UNESCO will include the island itself in the World Heritage List in 2015, which will be opposed already known to you neighbors of Japan. 
Now the island is open to the public, and rare tourist boats go to it. Of course, they won't let you just wander around the island, but at least one path has been made at a safe distance from collapsing buildings, and thanks for that. Monsell Forts, the United Kingdom. Today these structures look like scenery from some post-apocalyptic movie of the 90s, but at one time they were strategically important objects in the defense of Great Britain. These sea fortifications are called Monsell Forts. Forts of the original design were built at the mouth of the River Thames, near Essex. Engineer Guy Monsell's design was handed over to Holloway Brothers Limited in August 1942. In total, the planned special defense of the Thames estuary included, according to the minimum requirements, seven such fortresses, but managed to limit itself to three, seven towers each. The forces of the Luftwaffe attacked British naval targets with enviable regularity, and one of the rather vulnerable places was the sea docks, which needed defense from the sea. Also, it was through the mouth of the Thames that German aviation had access to cities, including London, the raids on which were regular. Since Great Britain is a maritime country, shipping has always been one of the priority areas in the economy. Naturally, Germany took advantage of this during the war, blocking many opportunities. The forts were built exclusively for air defense, and the Royal Fleet had to protect them from naval attacks. The forts were built on the docks and were towed to the installation site on pontoons. At the installation site, the depth averaged 10 meters. On July 3, 1943, the first such fort was installed, and in December, the last one was. Installation work had to be adjusted to the dates of low tide, which had to wait for two weeks. The fortress consisted of seven towers standing over the sea and connected by bridges. Four turrets were equipped with QFMK2C heavy 94mm anti-aircraft guns and one with two light rapid-fire 40mm L-60 Bofors anti-aircraft guns. The central tower was a command tower. It housed a radar and a command post, as well as vital three diesel generators of 30 kilowatts for the entire fort. Another tower was intended for lighting and was equipped with powerful searchlights. In total, during the war, the fort shot down a total of 22 enemy aircraft and 30 V-1 cruise missiles. The octagonal steel towers were equipped with central heating, ventilation, and freshwater tanks. For blackouts and additional protection of personnel, steel shutters were provided. Also included were toilets, showers, and even bathrooms with hot water. From 120 to 165 people lived in the fort, of which usually 90 marines, 30 sailors, and 3 to 6 officers, further as needed. The fortification was designed for a month of completely autonomous life, having everything necessary for this, but during the service, the message was not interrupted for more than a week. At the same time, telephone communication with the shore was implemented using a cable laid along the bottom and radio communications. For loading operations, five towers were equipped with electric lifts. For metal structures of approximately 300 tons, each acted as the foundation, and the supports consisted of three sections of five tons. Such massive structures were necessary due to frequent unrest on the water because even with a small storm, the structure experiences simply enormous loads. It was no longer necessary to build the remaining forts due to a change in the priorities of Germany, which more actively switched to the eastern direction, and aviation activity over British waters decreased significantly. After the end of the war, the forts were maintained in working conditions, but no more. They were put on alert during the Cold War, and in 1952 they were re-equipped with radar and lighting equipment. On March 1, 1953, the Norwegian ship Bailbeck, in conditions of poor visibility due to fog, collided with one of the fortresses, Nori U-5, and immediately destroyed two towers. In 1954, the situation repeated itself, but with the ship Marilla. After this incident, it was decided to dismantle the remains of the fort, which was carried out in 1960. The Shivering Sands base also lost one of the towers due to the mistake of the captain of the ship Rybersborg. All towers were abandoned in 1958, and even dismantling was deemed unprofitable. However, in the 1960s, radio pirates settled in some of them, broadcasting music illegally. 
The fact is that the forts were located in neutral waters, and according to the law, they could not do anything. To do this, they had to officially move the border territory by 12 miles, and to stop broadcasting, they even had to resort to the help of the military. At Rough Sands Fort, Patty Roy Bates was not ready to give up easily and declared his territory the independent state of Sealand, with its constitution and flag. Naturally, no one recognized this state, and the heirs are still trying to sue something. To date, the forts are abandoned, and even for excursions they are dangerous. Although, some researchers argue that the condition of the support and foundation is still far from critical. Cooling Tower, Belgium The coal station in Charleroi opened in 1921 and, having become the main supplier of electricity for the country, for many years provided energy to a large area of Belgium. Then the power plant was modernized by the Electrobel Corporation into the IM power plant, Power Plant IM. The station's cooling tower was one of the largest in Belgium. Water was led into the cooling tower, where it was cooled by the wind, which was passed through portals at the base of the tower, releasing columns of hot air. In the interwar period, the new power plant helped the rapid development of the Belgian industry and was still the country's main energy supplier. In 1958, the power plant began to be refurbished. Additional equipment was supplied, which made it possible to change coal to gas. By 1990, six power units were already operating at the station, two units of 60 megawatts, two units of 130 megawatts, and two units of 300 megawatts. The total capacity of the power plant was approximately one gigawatt, for this it was unofficially dubbed the gigawatt power plant. However, in the early 2000s, air measurements showed that 10% of the carbon dioxide emitted by factories in Belgium comes from the IM station. In addition, in Belgium in 1975, the first power units at the Dow and Tinga nuclear power plants were already in operation. Under pressure from the public organization Greenpeace, a decision was made to stop the station. She was deemed dangerous and not subject to conversion. In 2006, as a result of protests and demands from environmental organizations, the power plant ceased operations. The most impressive and interesting buildings on the territory of the station, a cooling tower and an abandoned cooling tower, remained open for a long time, which attracted tourists. But for several years, access there has been banned. End of part one. That's all for today. Thanks for watching this episode. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so as not to miss the second part, which will be released in the coming days. Mr. Top F was with you. See you soon. Bye.